Good morning. Uh, there's a thing that has happened in Christianity uh, almost since the inception of the church, and that is where someone will say, he is risen, and then the response is, he is risen indeed. How, how would you like to try that this morning, all right? So, he is risen. He is risen. <laughs> Amen. He is. Uh, can we thank the choir for the amazing job that they did this morning? Yeah. That was a special treat, and uh, Pastor Steve and the team did an astonishing job yesterday with our Easter egg hunt and all the kids from the community showing up for that. Um, there's a number of stories uh, surrounding the resurrection of Jesus, and uh, I would like to look at the last one that's listed in John's Gospel. And it's important uh, not only because Jesus is proving he's alive, he's actually engaged in doing something that could be very important for us to know about, and to experience for ourselves. Jesus was not just doing a magic trick. He wasn't trying to just prove his power by resurrecting from the dead. There was work that the resurrected Christ needed to do, and we need that. So this is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 21. It says, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, if you don't know, that's, that's John, and this is John's gospel, so he loves to put that in his gospel. <laughs> My, my, I had a sister who, who used to sign all of her notes to my parents, YFC, your favorite child. <laughs> it's, it's something like this going on here. And, uh, and so the, the, uh, he says, it is the Lord. And uh, when, when Peter heard him say that, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and they dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net had not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord. You know I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. There's no shortage of things that are controversial in our culture today. And I actually think that forgiveness is controversial and offensive to many people. Great deal of controversy surrounding the idea that someone could forgive or be forgiven. There are people who believe that forgiveness is actually a form of injustice. For you to forgive someone who's committed a wrong is basically to say that what they did didn't matter. And so they're very frustrated by that. If you, if you forgive people, there's an assumption there's no accountability. You just let them off the hook. And in our culture, we're seeing more and more of this, this evidence that once you've crossed over a line, 
Forgiveness is no longer an option because people think that forgiveness is pretending that nothing happened or forgiveness is seen sometimes even as a forced value on someone else. For example, if you're in a conversational therapy with a counselor, sometimes a counselor might actually view forgiveness as not working with you because they're there to support you and your challenge against other things in the world and they don't want to be seen as encouraging you to go back into a relationship that, that you don't want to be in anymore. And so forgiveness is kind of unknown in our world. But scripture, scripture gives us a very different view. Scripture reveals that every single one of us have acted in ways that weaken relationships and even break relationships. And the Holy Spirit not only helps us to experience forgiveness, but he helps us to practice forgiveness in order that real relationships could be restored rather than just always having to abandon them. Now, in our world, politics has kind of become a new religion. I won't ask you how many have noticed. But the idea of forgiven, forgiveness and redemption is not a political concept. If someone makes a mistake, if they stand for the wrong party, then the only option left is to separate yourself from them and attempt to silence them. You would think that our world is less moralistic, but the more we have moved away from Christian values, the more we have become more moralistic. And when you offend somebody, we have something called social media where you can take them to task and try to hurt them. And that happens all the time. Without forgiveness, there is no future you would want to live in. And our world is becoming less and less forgiving. Jesus even offered forgiveness on the cross, which seems insane to us. How is that possible to the very people who were executing him? How is that possible? Why would that even be desirable? And this is why. Because only forgiveness heals deep wounds. Only forgiveness restores you and, uh, and transforms you. And only forgiveness reconciles relationships. Without forgiveness, the only thing left for us is just resentment. And resentment leads to revenge. We're all appalled by the shootings that we hear about that, that break into news across the various size screens that we all have. But in almost every case, it's a matter of something that couldn't be forgiven and now other people have to pay. When our world sees examples of forgiveness, they're often perplexed and occasionally offended. Mostly, it's because they don't understand what forgiveness actually is. There is a way in our world where we accept forgiveness of others. It may have happened to you. You probably have heard about it. And that is someone that we've been very at odds with and, and something has never been resolved. And, and then in the last hours or days of their life, they're in a situation in a hospital or in hospice where they're suffering greatly. Their agony is obvious and their days are numbered. And then we feel something shift in our heart towards them and we feel as though forgiveness is being offered, but that's not really forgiveness. What's happening in that moment is that we feel that they have paid enough price, they've experienced enough pain, that it's equaled the balance now. And that's not what forgiveness is. We have to be very cautious that we don't just wait until we think someone else has suffered enough for us to be able to offer forgiveness to them. Something may change in our heart, but it's not worked out of forgiveness, it's worked out of the pain the other person has experienced. Now, why, how is this connected to this story? Well, Jesus obviously had forgiven Peter, but Jesus has more work to do with Peter. What he wants to do is to reinstate Peter, not just to his family of faith, but to his calling. And so Jesus very intentionally evokes two powerful memories in Peter's life in the actions that we just read about. Because only forgiveness is going to be able to heal wounds, to transform a heart, and to reconcile relationships. If you don't forgive, it's very hard to act forgiven. So, uh, by the way, all of us here have done something that we need to be forgiven of. And if you think you haven't, just ask the people nearest you and they will assure you that you have. So why do we tend to withhold forgiveness? That's a good question, right? 
Why do we tend to withhold forgiveness? And there's two really good reasons. And the first is unforgiveness makes us feel powerful. When I don't forgive you, then you're going to have to do some things in order to work your way back into my good graces. And so when I don't forgive you, sometimes I can exercise some control over you. And that, that feels good to us. We like that, especially against someone who's hurt us. And then the second thing is, is not only do we feel more powerful, we often feel superior. We'll tell ourselves something like this. I would never, I would never have done that to them. Okay, maybe not. But there's an, there is a possibility you would have actually done worse than them if you were in their situation. And there are lots of realities where you have done things that caused harm and hurt to other people and to ourselves. So sometimes we just feel superior. I would never have... Feeling powerful and feeling superior are hard things to give up. So Jesus goes after these two powerful memories. The first memory actually has to do with when Peter was called to be a follower. At this point in his life, early in, in the Gospels, he's just a bystander. He happens to be, uh, Jesus is near the lake and, and he's by the water and, and Peter is cleaning out his nets and his boat and, and Jesus asks to go out fishing. You can find this in Luke chapter five. And so uh, they launch out and, 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 and Jesus says, let's go fishing. And Peter says, we fished all night, we didn't catch anything. Does this sound familiar? And Jesus says, well, let's try. And, and Peter decides to do it, and he throws out the net, and they caught so many fish that multiple boats had to come in and help. And in that moment, Peter actually falls down to his knees in the boat at Jesus', uh, at Jesus feet, and he looks at him and he says, you need to get as far away from me as you possibly can, because I am a sinner, and people like you don't hang around people like me. And Jesus just looked at him, and he said, you don't have to be afraid. You follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And he's astonished at this. And this is how he not only is called to follow Jesus, but is called to a mission, that he will become fishers of people. How is that possible? Well, on this situation, um, Jesus calls out to them and he says, have you caught any fish? And, and they said, no. And he, he says, so throw your, your nets on the other side. And, and they catch all kinds of fish. And this is what's really interesting. After they caught all those fish, they even counted them because somebody there had counting sickness like I do. I count lots of things, you know. And so they counted them as 153 of them. It wasn't just about 150, it was 153. It's a good thing to know. And, and, and Jesus they said, it's the Lord. And Peter, what does he do? Does he fall down and say, get away from me? No, he's learned something in his time with Jesus. And he dives into the water. It's only 100 yards. He swims it as fast as he can. He wants to get as close to Jesus as possible. That would have triggered such a powerful memory. The day he was called to follow and the day he was called to be something significant in the mission of Jesus. But there's another memory. And this other memory actually has to do with a fire and Peter's denial. You can find this in Mark chapter 14. Jesus had told his disciples that all of them would, would turn away from him and all of them would run away. And Peter, you know, he, ab he abhors silence and he considers himself a man's man. And he just looks at them and he says, even if all these other disciples run away, I will not run away. I know who I am. And, and, and Jesus said, yep, you, you, will, you will run, you will hide, you will deny me, and you'll do it three times before the rooster crows tomorrow morning. And Peter is just offended. Well, Jesus winds up getting arrested and, and taken where they're going to put him on trial. And, and so Peter follows along from a distance and he goes into the courtyard of the place where this is happening. And it's a cold night. We know that. And the, and the guards are all sitting around the fire. And so, so Peter kind of gets close to the fire and he's sitting with the guards. And, and in the light of the firelight, a servant girl comes up to him and she, she looks at him and she says, I think I recognize you. You're one of those people who were followers of Jesus. And he says, no, nope, that's not me. That I don't know this guy. And so then she tells the people around the fire. She says, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's one of those guys. And he says, it wasn't me. And then the people around the fire say, you've got to be a follower of Jesus. You're from Galilee. Everybody there knows who he is. You must be a follower of Jesus. And at this point, 
Peter swears in every way you can. There's two ways to swear. One of them already came to your mind. <laughs> and some of you are thinking words that you should not be thinking right now. Where we use these kind of damning and destructive words in order to, to communicate how much frustration we have with someone or about something. And Peter does that. And then he also swears in the sense that he takes an oath. And he, he basically vows before everyone there, I don't know this guy, I've never known this guy, I'm not one of them. And right after he finishes that statement, the rooster crows. And Peter was completely shaken. Jesus had known something about him he did not know about himself. And so he runs out of the area and he just weeps bitterly. He sobs. He had denied and he had denied again and he had denied a third time. He had sworn in every way that you can swear. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. So Jesus leads him back to a fire. Just the smell of the smoke, just the heat radiating out. These memories would come to the forefront of Peter's mind. And Jesus asked Peter three times if he loves him. Is Jesus trying to rub Peter's nose in something? No, Jesus is doing surgery. Because there are ways Peter cannot forgive himself, and he's always going to be on the sidelines until something is done about that. And so Jesus asks him. Peter thought he was going to be a great leader to begin with because he was bold and he was brave and he was confident. But Jesus understood what makes a great leader is not your boldness or your competencies. What makes a great leader is someone who understands forgiveness really well. When you've been forgiven, it just decimates your pride. And when you are forgiving, it restores relationships. It heals wounds. So Jesus understood what would make Peter a great leader, and that's understanding forgiveness. First question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. He's calling them back into ministry. Second question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Third question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter's hurt now because Jesus asked him the third time. And there's a secret here. We should know the secret. Lord, you know all things. There it is. You know I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. What don't you know that God knows? And if you knew it, you could experience forgiveness or you could offer forgiveness to someone else. Peter had likely given up on the idea that he would ever be anyone significant. He'd failed. Peter believed Jesus loved him, but did not believe Jesus could still use him. That's a very common thought that we struggle with. Peter thought he would be a great leader, that he could be bold and brave, but what he found out was he wasn't either of those things. What would make him useful in God's kingdom was his love for Jesus. So we don't serve others because we think we're better than others. We serve others because we love the one who models serving and calls us to it and because we love the people that we serve. That's just a better reason to serve others in our world. So how do you know when you need to forgive someone? Quick question, all right? Here's a test. You don't have to actually raise your hands or anything. Just keep your scores and your answers to yourselves, all right? So someone, you see someone or they, or they say something and, and you do an eye roll. And, and the thought that you have is, what an idiot. Could need to forgive somebody there. Or you hear about a problem that the other person is having and it makes you a little bit happy. You've actually connected your happiness to their unhappiness. Mm. Could need to forgive. Um, you find most of the things they say annoying or irritating. 
could need to forgive. You start avoiding the person altogether, might need to forgive. You share negative information about that person with someone else. And you find some delight in doing it. Hmm. Might need to forgive. So how do we do it? First, name the wrong. Pretending is not saying nothing happened. Forgiveness doesn't say nothing happened or it doesn't matter. If nothing happened or it doesn't matter, forgiveness is not needed. Something happened that was wrong and it did matter and that is why forgiveness is needed. So don't pretend. And then secondly, see yourself as a fellow sinner. We're not better than others. We all have our weaknesses. We all have our mistakes, our misdeeds, our failures, all of us. And in their situation, we might not made, have made a better choice. We have to own our failures. And when we own our failures, it actually helps us learn how to forgive someone else. And then this is the part that is the little bit of a sticky part. You release the wrongdoer from payback. Because when anybody hurts you, don't you feel like they owe you something? And when you do something against them, don't we call that payback? And what forgiveness does is says, I'm not going to pay them back. I'm going to absorb that debt. We owe God. This is what people don't realize. And it's because of their concepts of God. They think that, that God is austere and, and distant and harsh and that he's just mad when people break his laws. And what's true is we've not broken his laws. We've broken his heart. And so... God didn't say it didn't matter. He knew we were hurting ourselves and others. He doesn't pretend anything. But what he does do is he offers payment. He absorbed the debt. Forgiveness is always very costly. If you don't know that, you haven't forgiven anybody yet. Without the resurrected Jesus, Peter would never have felt forgiven. He needed a private conversation. The crucified Christ paid for his debts. The resurrected Christ assured him of his forgiveness and reinstated him into his calling. We didn't gather here today just to honor the memory of a great person. We are restored to our relationship with God because of what Christ has done for us. Our world is not going to change by us trying to prove to everyone that we are right, but our world could change if we really experience forgiveness, both the receiving of it and the releasing of it. The question is not, does God love us? He proved that forever on the cross. The question is the one that Peter had to answer, do we love God? It was Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, that helped Peter realize that. So I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. And there's, something I'd like you to just to process, think about. I understand that there are people who've done wrong in our world and the wounds go deep. And what I want you to hear is, I am not telling you that didn't matter. Some people in this room have experienced such incredible wounds that it has altered the trajectory of their life in ways that still haunt them. So this is not a pastor saying that none of that stuff mattered. It does. And I understand it, but more than that, God understands it. We can't put ourselves in that prison and stay in it forever. And so we come to God for two things, to receive forgiveness, but also to release forgiveness. I don't have to tell you a set of rules in life. I don't have to open a Bible right now and, and recite the Ten Commandments and try to convince you of all the ways that you've, you've broken them. The truth is, is that every one of us have already communicated to others and to ourselves our own moral codes 
by all the things that we have said about others that they should have done. Why would we say that? Because we think that's what we would do in that situation. Or shouldn't have done. Why would we say that? Because we think we wouldn't have done that in that situation. And every one of those times, we acknowledge a kind of moral code in our heart. And the question is, can you honestly say that you never violated those things? that you always did what you always thought other people should do, and you never did what you never thought other people should do. And because of that, we all find ourselves in need of forgiveness. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. I'm gonna ask you to give yourself and others some privacy right now. And if you are here and you would like to experience the forgiveness of God, you want to trust what he paid for your faults and failures rather than you trying to pay for your faults and failures. And you want to begin that spiritual journey today. I'm going to ask you just to lift up your hand and look right at me. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you, but I would like, I would just like to know that you are starting this journey today. Thank you, I see that hand. I'm gonna start over on this side of the building. Uh, 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 well, it's hard for you to know which side, so it's the side that's not the Chile Avenue side, all right? And just hold your hand up high, and then just wait for me to acknowledge it, all right? Thank you, I see that hand, 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 thank you. Any others? I see that hand, thank you. Next section over, just anyone? I see that hand and that hand and that hand and that hand. Anyone else in this section? Just raise your hand. All right, I'm in the center section now. Just lift it good and high. I see that hand, thank you. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand, thank you. All right, next section over. If, you're, if you wanna make that journey start today, just see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, thank you. Anyone else? And in the last section by the windows, Anyone here? I see that hand and that hand. Anyone else? That hand, thank you. Could we all stand this morning? You might not have noticed, but the windows of heaven were open and grace flowed into this space. And right now, faults and failures, mistakes and misdeeds are being forgiven and people are being released to live the life that God always hoped and dreamed for them. And for others of us who need to, ex to express forgiveness to others, that experience is the key to be able to express. So Father, I thank you that our mistakes and our misdeeds have not separated us from you in a way that makes it impossible for us to connect with you. You paid the price and we are grateful. You love us and we acknowledge that today. And this morning we've made a determination. We also love you for all you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just give a, a sound of praise for those who crossed that line of faith this morning?